All right, so today we're going to talk about something, an emotion or emotions that is common to men. Emotions are common to men. Whether they be positive or negative, they're common to men. We, God gave us emotions for a reason. Nothing is wrong with them. It's how we respond to them that makes a big difference. We did pray already, right? Thank you. So, championing our fears in times of uncertainty. Do we survive and thrive? Or do we find ourselves defaulting to fighting, flying, like running away, or freezing up, not knowing what to do? Do I have the flexibility to go back and forth on this stage, or do I need to stay in one position? Do whatever I want, I want. Thank you. Thank you. He's so much on the ball. Josiah said, do whatever I want, my friends on, on Zoom. All right. So let me ask, what are some things that we're dealing with right now, per, whether it be on the personal level, on the community level, the educational level, geopolitical levels, that is ruffling our internal system right now? making us feel, feel kind of out of sort. What are some things? Anything we're dealing with right now that causes us to feel some sense of anxiety? Failing an exam. Adriana says failing an exam or even approaching exams. Many, many of our students are facing FSA and ESC and all the AE exams and exams are Exams are very anxiety provoking. Whether you studied or not, they are anxiety provoking. And if you don't study, they're worse anxiety provoking, right? What else are we facing that's causing fears and anxiety right now? People, um, friends on Zoom, you're free to open your microphone. Sister Peart said the hike in gas prices. That's true. We're paying almost double, right? We pay almost double. Um, in terms of filling up the tanks. These days, we probably can't even afford to fill the tanks. And food prices, too. Yeah, inflation. Anything else? Anyone on Zoom? God examining us. God examining us? All right, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elder Lifer said, planning to get on a plane. Summer is coming up and many of us will be traveling, but there are a lot of people who are fearful of flying, and that's true. I see that every day, Elder Lifer, that's true. It's really anxiety provoking anyway. Think about just being suspended in the air, you know? It's not like when you're driving and if the tire blows out, you can pull on the side of the road and take care of stuff. Uh, all right, so there are a lot of things. What about the war in Ukraine? Personally, for me, that was anxiety provoking when it started. You know, I, I found myself crying. All right, so let's do a little bit of reality testing. Uh, we're going to go to the second slide, okay? Reality testing. So you open the car door and see a 20 pounds monkey in the front seat. What would you do? Sister Pierce says she would run. <laughs> yeah, all right, so that's the flight response. Click on the, click on the, oh, I have the clicker, I forgot. I forgot I got the clicker. All right, let's see if the clicker works. Where should I point the clicker back there? Or does it matter? Here? Oh, the other way. There is a monkey. There is the monkey. So Sister Peart said she would run. Anyone on Zoom, what would you do? You open your car door and there is this, Stephanie said she would close back the door. And then what would you do after that? Animal control. Sister said she would scream and run. All right, so I hear a lot of flight responses. Let's go to the other one. One beautiful Sabbath afternoon, you want to take, you want to, we went to the park. And they're sitting on a park, park. No, we got up to look on a beautiful parrot in the tree. And when you turn around, we see him, a big black bear. 
<laughs> Stephanie said she would go up the same tree where the parrot is. She would join the parrot in the tree <laughs> and not come down. <laughs> oh, and if we... I just and and, and um, Tiana said if we run, the bear is going to chase us. No, that's serious. Yeah. So you were just watching without running. You wouldn't fight him. You wouldn't try to get the laptop from him. No? All right. All right. Third one. We heard on the news that men under the age of, between the ages of 18 to 70 years old, are being sent, Elder Amos, to Ukraine for an Operation Ukraine mission. What would you do? You heard on the news that men between the ages of 18 to 70 are being sent to Ukraine for an Operation U Ukraine mission. What would you do? Elder Amos said he would flee to Jamaica. <laughs> Just I say he's not sure. Um, Elder Edwards, Elder Edwards, you don't fall in that category. It's between eighteen to seventy. Elder Pierre, what would you do? He's not. He's not. Who is on? Who are the I'm gentlemen? on. I'd pray and ask God for direction. You would pray and ask God for direction. That's an awesome response. Josiah said he would ask for directions out the country. All right. So with all those three scenarios, we heard different responses. Some people said they would run in certain situations. Some would. I didn't hear anyone say they would fight, like fight the bear or fight the monkey. Somebody in line said, I'm running. Running to where? Who do you run to? All right. So, in all of these scenarios, we see where these scenarios would trigger a response. And that behavioral response is really governed by the emotions that we're feeling, okay, and the thoughts that we're having. And all of these are really anxiety provoking. Now, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has made our bodies in such a way that Depending on what we're facing, there is an automatic response in our bodies that can help us to cope. So we have what's called the autonomic nervous system, and it's divided into two sections. Elder Edwards is here. It's divided into the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And it's very important, I think, that we really understand the role of these systems especially in times of crisis. Because a lot of times we think that we're just going on autopilot, but there are systems in our bodies that's regulating our behaviors. The sympathetic nervous system is the threat response. It's activated in times of crisis. It's the fight, fright, or freeze response. Now this system is very, very important. It plays a very important role in times of stress. In times of crisis, for example, walking on the street one day and somebody comes up and grabs our bag. This system mobilizes us to get into action. Now we have to decide quickly, am I going to run from this person? Am I going to try to get my bag from this person? Or am I, am I going to just freeze and cry for help? Right? So this system plays a role in protecting us. God is awesome in the way that we were designed. He placed a system within us to protect us in times of danger, okay? The, sym the sympathetic nervous system, though, is activated in times of real or imagined threat. That's the thing. This system does not distinguish between real or imagined threat, and that's why sometimes we end up with anxiety issues because sometimes when no threat, no real threat is imminent, we still feel anxious, because the system is still focusing on a perceived threat. And we're gonna talk about that later, okay? But hear this. The body was not designed to stay in the system chronically, 
And we're going to talk about that later. If we find ourselves staying in that fight, fright, or flight response system long term, it has adverse consequences on our bodies and on our brains and on our behavior. It's even going to affect our relationships. Think about it if you're living with somebody who is highly anxious and every time you say something to them, they go off on you. That's serious, right? Yeah, it doesn't create a very harmonious relationship. So we're not designed to stay in the fight, fright, or flight response system long term. It's just for short term to protect us when there is real threat. Then there is a parasympathetic nervous system. And I love talking about the parasympathetic nervous system because it's a system that with intention, we can activate to down-regulate the sympathetic nervous system. And this is something that I teach people every single day. When we're feeling anxious, we're not left to the mercies of anxiety. There are things that we can do. God has designed us in such a way that there are things that we can actively and intentionally do to down-regulate the sympathetic nervous system. So Adrian, when you're at school and you're preparing for an exam, feel anxious, right? Yeah, feel very anxious. We don't have to be in an exam and be so anxious that our prefrontal cortex shuts down and we end up failing the exam. It may have happened to some of us before, it has happened to me before, until I learned how to conquer that situation. Or, or we come to church and Sister Rita will say, I need you to go up and, and sing a song. I need you to go up and do the announcements because Sister Martin did not make it to church this morning and we need somebody to do it. You're like, huh, me? And we're all frozen up. I'm going up there. Then we have stage fright, right? It's very, very, very common. It's called performance anxiety. It has a name. It's very common, performance anxiety. When we are under the microscope, sometimes we, our brains, our amygdala, interprets that as real threat because now the brain is saying, somebody's gonna criticize you. You're not gonna do a good job. You're gonna forget what to say. You, you're gonna trip up on the words. You're gonna fall down on the stairs. You're gonna fail. Our brains start catastrophizing and then guess what? We're like, no, Sister Rita, I can't do that. I'm scared, all right? It happens to all of us. It has happened to me already before too. Just saying, you know, normal. However, However, there are things that we can do to downregulate that system, okay? And that's where we're going to activate the parasympathetic nervous system with intention because that's a rest and a digest system in the body. Isn't that beautiful? God created our bodies with a rest and digest system. When this system is activated, recovery happens, healing happens, restoration happens, and it counteracts the effects or the damage of the sympathetic nervous system. Let me ask you all, what are some of your symptoms of anxiety? We all have felt some kinds of an anxiety, or it may be even anger. You know, anger is a fight response, you know? What are some symptoms? How do you know when you're feeling anxious, Adriana? How do you know? Legs shake. All right, how do you know, uh, Abigail? Can't talk properly, that's true. Um, Sister Lifer, I know what you're saying. The heart racing, the heart is racing. Somebody on Zoom. Now we're gonna do what's called mindfulness. That's what we're doing now, mindfulness, okay? Mindfulness is coming in the present and paying attention to what's going on in our bodies. How do you know when you're feeling anxious? Because that's a very, very important aspect of conquering any disabling emotions. We first have to know what we're feeling. We have to know. Perspiration, sweating, elder, that's true. Yeah, we get hot. Um, Zoom, speak to me, you're quiet. Well, except I did hear from elder. Bite my nails. Biting the nails, yes, what else? Stomach ache. Huh? Nervous Ta stomach. Yes, yes, and I'm gonna tell you why, we're getting somewhere. Diarrhea, Diarrhea. yeah, anybody else? All right, sweating I got enough. Sweating profusely. No, oh, yeah, sweating profusely, yeah. Dizziness, yeah. All of those, thirsty, you're right. All of those 
are because of the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, the fight, fright, or freeze response system, okay? Because our bodies are being mobilized for action. So guess what happens when this system is activated? Why do we have the stomach ache? Because when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, the di digestion shuts down. The body is saying eating is not important right now. Your legs are important and your hands right now. So don't think about eating nothing. You know, have you ever noticed that sometimes when we're anxious or mad or sad, we don't even feel like eating. It's like food doesn't... Even if you eat, it doesn't feel... It, it's not enjoyable, right? Also, salivation. We stop salivating. And that's why even when we're having... Like when we come here on stage to do something and we have that performance anxiety, you, we notice that the, the throat gets dry. Yeah. And then we start, as, as Abigail said, we start having problems to talk and we're bucking up on the words because salivation is shutting down, right? Yeah. And so you have to drink some water. Yeah, you gotta drink some water. So that's something that happens. I'm hearing feedback. Is it me or is it you? Or maybe it's a conference, I don't know. All right, another thing that happens when we're in the sympathetic nervous system mode is that, thank you, pay attention to this. Listen to what happens. You know, we're in an age where we're trying to manage weight, right? We're controlling weight. Did you know that stress contributes to weight gain? Chronic stress is a contributor to weight gain because what happens is when we're in that chronic stage of stress, the body pulls glycogen from the muscles and dumps that and glucose and dumps that into the bloodstream. So we are on high, even if you're not eating a lot of sugar, we're still having high, high, sugar, high levels of sugar in our bloodstream. And guess what? When that is not, especially when it's, just, it's not a real threat, we're not running and sweating and using up energy, that excess sugar turns to what? It turns to fat. Yeah. Cortisol and adrenaline is also stress hormones. They are important when there's a real threat. They set us into action. They make us become more alert, right? We become hypervigilant. However, when it's chronic stress and there's no real threat, nobody's breaking into the house, nobody's breaking into the car, nobody's physically attacking you, that cortisol and adrenaline, it's not good for our bodies long term. Also, Sister Riddle spoke about the heart rate. When we are in that state of constant heightened stress and anxiety, our heart beats faster. Think about it. Your heart is beating faster. Blood flow is rushing through the blood vessels. And this is what's going to happen over time. Pay attention to this. This is a matter of life or death. Over time, the heart muscles either expand and eventually they pop heart attack. Research has shown the heart attack is most common on Monday mornings. Why? Why? The weekend is over and we're going to work and we don't like work stressful. And you think, Lord, may I have to go back into work. And if that's happening every Monday morning, think about it. And then you go to work and we're constantly stressed. So either the, the, with the increased heart rate, heightened blood pressure, either the blood vessels are expanding and eventually they, they, they wear out and pop or we have brain aneurysm, or the vessels become hardened and there we have heart disease. So that's something to really pay attention to, okay? And there are other things that happen. Um, so on the other side though, we have the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? God has not left us without help. When we activate with intention, the parasympathetic nervous system, it counteracts everything I just spoke about. It slows down our heart rates. It causes digestion to start going again. We are able to eat and digest our food. Another thing is chronic stress leads to, leads to digestive issues, such as ulcers and um, bloating, and of course, constipation, diarrhea. I think GERD, all of those stuff, right? So if you're having, if we find that we're having chronic digestive issues, check our stress levels too. Stress, check our stress and anxiety or even anger. 
You know, every time that we are triggered and we stay in that angry mode, irritable mode, that's what happens to the sympathetic nervous system is being upregulated. So we want to downregulate that system by activating the parasympathetic nervous system because what happens at the point is that our bodies will reduce the level of cortisol and adrenaline. Um, our digestive system is back in, you know, working, functioning well. Our heart rate is slowed down and we get into a state of rest and peace and calm. All right, let's look at some of the, oh, that's a quiz, but I'm going to bypass that for time's sake. All right, let's look at some, and sorry, my PowerPoint is a little small. I, I apologize. I hope those on Zoom can see well. Let's look at some of the conditions that are associated with the dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. So that's when the sympathetic nervous system is being upregulated. Cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension and heart failure, type 2 disease, autoimmune diseases, obesity, cancer. What a cancer, you know why? Because stress also increases inflammation in the body. When that system is just constantly going, the sympathetic nervous system, inflammation is increased in our bodies, and cancer is one of the illnesses associated with increased inflammation. What are some mental health conditions? Depression, anxiety, chronic stress, PTSD, schizophrenia, anxiety, Parkinson's disease, borderline personality disorders, eating disorders, and chemical and process addictions. Chemical addiction is like addiction to weed, you know, ganja. That's what we say in Jamaica, right? ganja. <laughs> addicted to being addicted to weed, um, other drugs, alcohol, nicotine. And the process addiction is gambling, porn, video games, all that stuff, okay? Okay, so that being said, how can we assist our bodies to get into a state of rest and digest? How can we do that? I'm going to share mental interventions, spiritual interventions, nutritional interventions, and physical interventions. Any questions before I move on? Plain and, all right, Elder Edward said I'm doing fine. So I'm making things plain and, and clear, which is a good thing. All right. So, this is not an exhaustive list, okay? Whatever I share today, there's a million and one intervention that can be utilized to, to, to um, trigger that parasympathetic response. So I'm just sharing a few in the interest of time. All right, so the mental cognitive interventions. I love the word of God. Whatever situation we're in, there's a passage that speaks to that situation. And when it comes to mental or cognitive interventions, Philippians 4 verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are what? True. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatever things are just and pure and lovely and of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know what that tells me, brethren? That our thoughts have power. You know? I can't see you guys. Our th this is a reading glasses. It's not for long distance. Our thoughts have power. So we've got to pay attention to our thought patterns. Learn and practice the gift of cognitive reframing. I'll tell you about that later. And recognize our locus of control. And I'll talk to you about that in a few minutes. What is the locus of control? All right. Mental cognitive interventions. Recognize when we're using what we call cognitive distortions. These are thinking patterns that we use without even realizing that we're using them. It's arrows in thinking, irrational thoughts. For example, there is one called all or nothing thinking. All or nothing thinking. It's like the world is either black or it's white. There is no shades of gray in between. And that's not really so, right? For example, like I said, I was in a session and a client told me, she said, you know, we're working through these, working through the distortion. Then she said, and I asked her, when you're feeling depressed, what is the thought that comes to mind? And she said to me, I am worthless. A lot of people who've been through trauma, 
that is some of their default patterns of thinking because mama told you that and papi told you that and uncle told you that when you were growing up and the body keeps a score the brain holds on to those messages okay so it's not that she is uh, uh, mentally weak or whatever but it's it's the it's the effect of trauma the body keeps a score okay so i am worthless this is a bad day a lot of us, we wake up and something happens first thing in the morning that we don't like, and then something else happens. Oh, it's a bad day. It's going to be a bad day. That's all or nothing thinking. We're setting up ourselves to have a bad day, okay? No one likes me. Nobody likes me. Ever found ourselves thinking that way? You don't have to share. But a lot of teenagers sometimes struggle with that thought too because of you know what they've been through so that's an all or nothing thinking okay then what about catastrophizing has anyone ever heard that catastrophizing do we know what that is hmm? yeah <laughs> catastrophe yeah you're right you're getting there brother Louis that's true catastrophe so it's where we think of the worst possible outcome when COVID started, we catastrophized a lot. We did. It was like Armageddon. Huh? The world is coming to an end. The sky is falling. Remember? Yeah. Elder Lifer told himself a million times he had COVID. Yes. All you got to do is cough. Elder Life has said, all we had to do is cough. I have a little runny nose. Of COVID, I'm going to die. Of COVID, my life is not going to... And I'm not downplaying that COVID did. Huh? <laughs> Elder Ever says, some people carry the lice. So unless somebody coughed, they just sprayed. <laughs> Yeah, because our brains are catastrophizing. And I'm not, I'm not downplaying that COVID is a serious illness and we need to take it seriously. However, and of course, we've had losses to COVID, right? But we're st it didn't take out everybody. Thank God. It didn't take out all of us. And, and to those who have losses because of COVID, my heart goes out because that's, that's significant. And my heart goes out, okay? However, it, in putting things in perspective anyway, we recognize that some of us did survive and continue to survive COVID. So, you know, we end up catastrophizing. Or, as Adriana said earlier, a lot of us, we think, if I fail my exam, I'm going to be poor for the rest of my life. And, and parents, we're guilty of that too. You know, I see it a lot in my work where parents will tell children, if you don't get all A's, if you don't get A's on your exam, you are going to go work at where? McDonald's. We, we tell, yeah, I hear it a lot. You're going to work at McDonald's. And you're, gonna you're not going to come to anything good. That's catastrophizing, you know? I'm not saying that we shouldn't thrive for A's, but if we get B's and C's, we're still okay, you know? Just saying. So we got to pay attention to our thinking patterns because these thinking patterns of thinking in extremes, they really set us up, and what happens is, they, um, their emotions attached to these thinking patterns, anxiety, sadness, depression, frustration, irritability, feeling super stressed. And on the screen, I have the cognitive triangle. There's a big connection and there's a big undeniable connection between thoughts, emotions, and behavior. Anything that we're feeling has a thought attached to it and more than likely, there's a behavior. So when we're thinking in terms of anxious thoughts, we end up retreating, social isolating, becoming hypervigilant. Verbally and aggressive behaviors are also associated with our thinking patterns. Um, you know, they found that during COVID-19, incidents of child abuse went up. Kids are home, right? And of course, the online learning was driving us all crazy as parents. And then we have to deal with the odds. So we were teachers and parents and everything all at once, and it was stressful, right? And so you find, you find that if we're not regulating, as we should, it can translate into verbal and physically aggressive behaviors, and even in terms of marital relationships too. When emotions go unchecked, 
it can be dangerous. When we are in this anxious or angry mode, we neglect our self-care and we become mistrustful of others and we become very guarded amongst other things, right? So there's that strong connection between thought, feelings and behavior and that is why it's so important that we're paying attention to our thought patterns. And what do we do when we find ourselves thinking that way? And there are other cognitive distortions. I just choose two today. There's jumping to conclusion. There's mind reading. There are many others. That's for, like for another, another presentation. Okay, what do we do when we recognize that we are um, using these distortions? Well, God has made us in a beautiful way. You see, this brain that we have, it's powerful. Our brains every day can engage in what we call neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. We can teach our brains how to think efficiently and positively, okay? Neuroplasticity is when we're, that we're strengthening connections in our brains, okay? And neurogenesis is when our brains are growing new brain cells and forming new connections. It's a process of learning. And we can learn. We're not too old to learn behaviors and learn new ways of thinking, right? All right, so how do we do that? We always want to pay attention to how we're thinking. It's like you watch yourself thinking, right? Self-monitor our thoughts. We want to challenge and dispute negative thoughts. If they sit there, they're going to grow and they're going to mushroom. We're going to have one thought adding to another to another, and eventually we feel defeated and anxious. So challenge and dispute negative thoughts. Look for the exceptions. The thought may be, I am worthless. When I asked my client yesterday, give me evidence that you're worthless, she was silent. I said, let's talk about things that tells you that you are not worthless. And she was like, well, I, I, went, I, went to, I have a job, I have a college degree, da 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 da, da. right? So I said to her, so who, where did you hear, who told you that you're worthless? And she told me who told her that she was worthless, right? So not because somebody tells us that we're something means that it's true. We don't have to hold on to it, we don't have to believe it, challenge it, dispute it, look for exceptions. The thought may be, if I drive from my home to church, I might have an accident, so I'm not going to leave. Oh, Pris, huh? Yeah. Trauma. The body keeps a score. And those, um, it's not just the thought, but that's attached to behaviors. You know, when a child is being abused over time, right? Um, the child learns from an early age that the world is not safe. And that central nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system becomes overly regulated for that child. And they get stuck in that mode of living for, without even recognizing it. And so the brain, the, the, the amygdala, holds on to that message that I'm a failure, I'm worthless, I'm ugly, no one likes me. Especially if the person is still being treated that way in their environment, it's hard for them to, to um, believe otherwise. Children live what they learn. And believe me, we have to be very mindful of how we are impacting the next generation. It's a very active process because whatever we say, it goes and it lives on their nervous system. Think about your experiences growing up as a child and what formed you. A lot of times we don't even recognize how trauma, how, tra how, how our behaviors, even us as adults, our behaviors, a lot of our behaviors are ridden in trauma, are embedded in trauma that we don't even know that we have. You know, sometimes, we find that our default patterns is like we become loud and irritable, and it's kind of a default pattern when we're triggered. We don't realize that it's coming because, because we're raised in an abusive home, right? Or the default pattern of thinking maybe I can't come up here and do something in church because all our lives we were told that we're, we're nothing. I mean, personally, my dad usually tell me that, tell us that we, 
I won't even tell, tell you guys what he used to tell us, right? But as I became an adult, I had to challenge those negative. Because for a while, I believed them. Because, it, I mean, your parents are telling you stuff. Children is going to believe what their parents tell them, you know? Yeah. So it's very, very important that we recognize our thought patterns and be very actively, be an active participant in reframing. Look for the exception. The thought may be, if I drive, if I, if I drive to church, something bad may happen to me. Ask yourself, did you ever do that before? Yeah. When did you do that? Last week. Okay. So go in, go in, go in strength. You can do it. Go ahead, Elder. That's a good question, Elder. Is it a way of making excuses? A lot of these, um, if we're aware and we're not making an effort to change behavior and we're just explaining, oh, it's because I went through this or I went through that, then, yeah, then yes, it's an excuse. But some of these reactions, Elder, are involuntary. They're unconscious. We don't even recognize when, they, when we're engaging in them. Right? They're, they're, they're very unconscious behaviors. And to understand it, we have to look at it more from that trauma-informed perspective, which is like another presentation on trauma, right? And how, how, how the body keeps a score. But it can be an excuse when we become aware. But when we're not aware of what's really governing our behaviors, then, because a lot of times, the thoughts are sometimes even outside of our awareness. Okay, and that's why therapy works, because in therapy, people gain awareness. Then we want to replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts. And we can use a THINK acronym. Is my thought, is it truthful, is it honest, is it inspiring, is it nice, is it kind, okay? All right, one more thing that's very important in terms of the mental intervention is recognizing our locus of control. I cannot overemphasize the importance. I'm watching the time, it's 7.17. All right, our locus of control, this is important. It's important that we radically accept the things that are outside of our control. And I say radically accept because it doesn't mean that we like them all the time, but when we don't accept them, it creates more anxiety. For example, when the pandemic started, a lot of people were saying, oh, it's not a pandemic, and I'm not gonna wear no mask, and I'm not gonna go into lockdown, right? And that just created more stress. We're fighting against reality. Radically accept that a war is going on in Ukraine. Radically accept that the housing market is terrible right now, especially for people who are trying to rent or buy. It's terrible. But that's something we have to radically accept and maybe think, okay, maybe I need to wait a little longer before I go after that goal, right? Can be frustrating. Radically accept that gas price is up. So probably what we got to do is cut down on how much we're driving or something like that, or use the AC less, you know, <laughs> to save on gas. Radically accept that the world is made up of all kinds of people. And we cannot, we have no control over people's behavior. Radically accept that not everyone is going to like us as Christians. Not everybody's going to like us. The Bible tells us. As much as we're being kind and loving and, and pure, you know, and, and helpful, as Christians, not everybody is going to like us. So in terms of our locus of control, in the, you know, I have two little two circles on the screen. In the blue are the things that are inside our control. In the gray are the things that are outside of our control. And it's important that we always ask ourselves when we're faced with a situation, what's in my control? What is outside of my control? And how am I going to cope with the things that are outside of my control? For spouses, your spouse behavior is not in your control. A lot of times after we have controlling issues in marriages because we're trying to control what the other person does and say. You know, we can, with positive communication, we can try to influence, but we cannot control other people's behaviors. We're driving on the road and someone is engaging in road rage, let them go. We can't control their behavior. Either we go around them or we, or we step back and let them go, right? That is something to be mindful of, that 
in order to have mental peace, it's important that we exercise our locus of control in every single situation. All right, so those are some mental cognitive interventions. Let's talk about the... Can you, can you help me with the other slide, please? Some of my clicker is not cooperating. <clears throat> All right, the role of exercise. The emotion, thank you, emotions live in the body. Whatever emotion we feel, and remember when I asked us all to talk about, identify how we know when we're feeling stress or mad or whatever, and you're able to identify what we call the somatic symptoms, right? The weakness in the knees, the stomach discomfort, all the heart racing. Emotions live in our bodies, and a great way to manage emotions is to get the body moving. Exercise changes brain chemistry. When we exercise, our bodies release endorphins, and endorphins are powerful at canceling out cortisol and adrenaline effects, okay? Then there's what we call vagal tone exercises. I'm going to spend some time on this. Vagal tone exercises. Remember the parasympathetic nervous system. A great way to activate that rest and digest system is by doing vagal tone exercises because the vagal muscle is one of the longest muscles in the parasympathetic nervous system. It runs from behind the ear, uh, the throat, the chest, into the, the stomach and the reproductive organs. So how do we do that? One way is, I'm need, I'm, I need someone to, be a, to hold the microphone for me because I need to demonstrate something. Please, thank you. A vagal tone exercise. This is something that I teach a lot and I've seen the and, and this is something that is good for small kids. You know, thank you, darling. If you're with a small child and they're having an, an anxious moment, maybe crying, throwing a tantrum, teachers, even teachers, you know, I think Sister Pat is here too. This is beneficial. So our bodies have what we call meridian points, okay? And these are points in our bodies that can send a calming message to our amygdala, which is a fight, fright, or fear response system in the body, the limbic system in the brain. So... One way is to, so you form like a butterfly with your hands and put it on the chest because on the chest what we have is a meridian point. And the communication between the body and the brain is bi-directional. The brain talks to the body and the body talks to the brain. So if you're having that moment where the chest is, where your heart is racing, right, and you know you're anxious, maybe it's an exam, whatever it may be, one thing that we can do is bilateral tapping. Okay, so taking a deep breath. Now, deep breathing is powerful for triggering the parasympathetic response because when we take a deep breath, it slows down the heart rate. It slows down the, the blood, right, the blood pressure. Deep breathing also allows the body to release acetylcholine, and that's the primary neurotransmitter for the parasympathetic nervous system, and it helps us to get into that state of calm. So we take that deep breath. Oh, and make the exhale longer. The exhale must be longer than the inhale because the relief is in the exhale. Sorry, sweetie, I want to show something. So notice my deep breathing, okay? You breathe out like you're, sorry, you breathe out like you're putting out a candle through pursed lips to slow down that exhale. Breathe with intention. God has given us deep breathing. It's free. You don't got to pay nothing for it. And it's very accessible. It's powerful. So. I like the sound of that. It sounds powerful. Is that any ocean? Calming, right? So make sure that, make that exhale as long like an eight-second eight, eight second exhale because when we're, when we're exhaling, the body is releasing acetylcholine. Have five minutes? Have five minutes. Gee, all right. The body is releasing acetylcholine and that really slows down the heart rate, okay? So, Ariana, Ariana, can you come back please? Thank you. I'm going to demonstrate this. And other ways are, Ayana, sorry, sorry. Other ways are laughter, laughing is good. Hugging within proper boundaries is good. And if you can't find somebody to hug, hug yourself. Hug creates safety, okay? 
um, labeling the emotion, name the emotion. When we name our emotions, we're sending blood flow from the emotional mind to the prefrontal cortex. Research has shown that. And that helps us to get into the prefrontal cortex to think. Because the emotional mind is very hot-tempered, very irascible, very um, quick to act. You know, act without thinking, that's the emotional mind. We don't want to be in the emotional mind in a time of crisis. We want to be in the rational mind or in the wise mind. So one way to do that is to label the emotion, identify the emotion. Just by naming the emotion, we're getting blood flow back to the prefrontal cortex where we can start thinking. So label the emotion. I'm feeling anxious. Breathe on that. Then tap on it. Tap on it, bilateral tapping. Tapping, bilateral tapping. And then we positively affirm, I'm feeling anxious right now, but I know I'll be okay. We're sending a message to the amygdala, and we're also rewiring the brain. Tell your brain that. I'm feeling mad right now, but this too shall come to pass. And tap on it, just tap. And breathe. All right, so that's a great way. Thank you, thank you so much. That is a wonderful way to trigger the parasympathetic nervous system response. Um, and monotasking. What is monotasking? I'm gonna stop here today. What is monotasking? Notice when we're multitasking. When you're multitasking, how do you feel? How do you feel when you're multitasking? Anxious, stressed, right? Overwhelmed, yeah, very overwhelmed. So one way to trigger that parasympathetic nervous system response is to engage in monotasking. It could be in the middle of work. And a lot is going on. A lot of deadlines needs to be met. Take that 10 minutes for your lunch, that 30 minutes for lunch, whatever, even if it's five minutes, and just engage in monotasking. And that's where we're doing one activity. And that could be just going for a very short, going for a walk, but walking slowly and breathing mindfully and using that positive affirmation, okay? Monotasking. Or monotasking could be just sitting back in your chair and putting on a meditative message or a meditative song. We're soothing the amygdala, okay? So monotasking is one way to trigger that parasympathetic response. All right, I'm gonna go to the end because I wanna be respectful of time. And these, these um, interventions we want to do with intention until they become habitual. Whatever muscle we use the most becomes more dominant. So if we're using the sympathetic nervous system response muscles more, more um, frequently, where we're in that stress response, that's gonna be more dominant. If we're using the parasympathetic nervous system muscles, that's become more dominant and we'll be in a state of calm, even in, even in the face of anxiety and stress and crisis, we can be as calm as possible. Diet is important. One thing that I highly advocate is to incorporate spirulina into our diet. Spirulina is a superfood, a green food, but it's a source of tryptophan. And tryptophan is a building block for serotonin and, and um, endorphins and dopamine. And these are all neurotransmitters that help us to feel calm and to feel happy, okay? I'm gonna kind of jump over that. Drinking water is good. Spiritual intervention, I cannot overemphasize trusting in God. Read his words, prayer, spiritual songs, fellowship. Research has shown that all of these change brain chemistry. When we are in tune with God and nature, and we're giving him our problems, and we're trusting him in the face of adversity, the body releases oxytocin. Oxytocin plays a role in attachment, okay? In families, oxytocin binds us together. When you spend, spend time with your spouse, you know, the body releases oxytocin, you feel closer to that person. When we spend time with our children, and we have, you know, great time together, the body releases oxytocin. Oxytocin is actually that first stuff that is released during breastfeeding. I hope I'm politically correct by saying that. But when the mother breastfeeds her baby, the body releases oxytocin, that first thing that comes out, and that binds 
the child to the mom. Isn't God awesome the way that he designs us? So when we pray and we trust in God, whether it be in times of peace or, or, or in times of crisis, it, our brains, it changes our brain chemistry. And our brain releases oxytocin that brings us into a state of calm. Okay? So that's something to keep in mind. All right. My final two slides and then I'm done. The same way that if we're going to say hang a drape at home, we need different tools, right? Why do we need to hang a drape at home, Elder Edwards? What do you use if you're hanging a drape for Sister Edwards? Ladder, hammer, screwdriver, nail. Drill, exactly, right? So we need different tools to accomplish that task. It's the same thing. When we are facing stress, anxiety, feeling mad, whatever, um, coping skills are more effective when they are combined. So we can combine our coping skills, what we call distress tolerance skills or emotional regulation skills to have better outcomes. We may need to do a good cry, then talk to a friend, then pray. We may need to go drink some yogi stress relief tea. Yogi stress relief tea, it sells at Walmart. I'm not advertising for them, but it really works because it's, it, it's an adaptogen that releases cortisol levels in our bodies, okay? If we don't have pre-existing medical conditions, one of the things that I use personally for me is ashwagandha. It's for it's good at regulating, at also re um, reducing cortisol level. Getting out into the sun, vitamin D3 is the building block for um, serotonin and endorphins. And if we're not getting enough sun, supplement with vitamin D3. Very important for our mental health. All right. In closing, for God has not given us a spirit of what? Spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind. So we don't have to allow fear and anxiety to overcome us, we can champion our fears with intention. Nelson Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear. Courage does not mean that we'll never feel fearful, but it's a triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. And I think that's just so powerfully said. So with that thought, I say, the end. Amen. Thank you. I don't know if I have time for questions and answers. Sister Tiana. Or elders. If we don't. All right. Um, I do have permission to take two questions. Any questions? Anyone on Zoom has a question? She was, she was depressed, you know? So she tried to kill herself a number of times. But something struck me uh, when she was talking to the doctor, where she said that she was con consistently or continually feeling sad. She felt like she had no hope. And she said something very interesting. I don't know if you have ever met or, or treated somebody like that. She actually said that she fell in love with sadness. You, you, you know, I mean, is, is that possible? For, you know, because th that's the only love she talk about, like she fell in love with sadness. So is there something that's possible? Of course, that was a movie, right, Elder? And, and, and movies will, you know, manipulate reality. Um, but what I heard is clinical features of depression. And sometimes people just lose the will to live. Keep in mind that um, just like physical, and going back to a question that you asked, Elder, about whether or not it could be an excuse, you know, the way that people are thinking. But the same way that 
hypertension has its symptoms and um, diabetes has its symptoms and cancer has its symptoms. Mental conditions have their symptoms. I have not treated a client for anxiety, not for anxiety. I've not treated a client for depression, for clinical depression that doesn't have suicidal thoughts. I have not yet, okay? So how do we diagnose depression or anxiety? It's a, it's a number of clinical features, okay? We don't just come up with a diagnosis. Which means that these um, disorders, they have specific symptoms. So for her, um, the, I hear the anhedonia, not having interest. I hear the depressed mood, the sadness. I hear the hopelessness. All of those are clinical features. However, it's a movie, and so she said she fell in love with sadness. There are still um, just people who lose the will to live, and they, don't, they can't see another option. Depression is like a cloud and you can't see beyond it. You can't see beyond it until you get beyond it. So it could be that she just doesn't know how to live otherwise because of the chronic state of sadness that she's been in. And many people are like that. And that's why we have incidents of suicide. You know, so depression, anxiety, other mental illnesses, they do have real symptoms. And that's something that we really have to be mindful of, okay? Even the thinking patterns, the catastrophizing, the all-or-nothing thinking, all of those are clinical features of depression. Okay? Any other question? Good. All right, thank you all for listening. Walk in the power of the Lord. Thank you. Oh, I'm